I'm not a big fan of Hallmark movies. Those romance movies and Christmas in July and all that stuff. But I watched one the other night. A mystery movie. And the quote that came out of it was, Luck is a lazy man's religion. And the theme of that particular show had a lot of very good uh, ethical theme to it, spiritual theme to it. And I thought they did a very good job of presenting that. So every once in a while, you, you run on to those kinds of things. And, and, and that kind of stuck in my mind. And uh, so anyway, and it happened to be, it happened to be in one of those made for Christmas kind of thing. So anyway, who knows? Who knows? Last week, we ended with this. Jesus has come to the end of the 15th chapter, leading up to the two verses we're going to talk about today, is this period of, of time that he talks about the world's going to hate you because it hated me first. If you're a follower of mine, they will hate you. Not because they hate you, but they hate for who, what you stand for. Because they hated me. That was the theme of that particular passage that we had last week. Starting next week, we're going to start that 16th chapter. I know some of you didn't even know John had 16 chapters in it. It's been so long ago since we started this. Next week, we start, and in that 16th chapter, it goes back to this theme of they're going to try to discredit you. They're going to try to stumble you. You're going to face adversity. So what I want to look at today is the two verses in between, sandwiched in between. We'll see that in a, in a little bit. We'll see about context and how important that is. One of the things that we had in the little Bible study we completed here about how to read the Bible, I thought the uh, author of that particular study did a very good job of saying, you got to look at the context. And this is a, a perfect example of the context because when John originally wrote this, it wasn't divided into chapters and, and, uh, and verses. It was a thematic. And the theme was talking about how the world's going to treat you because you are not of the world. We'll talk about that in a second. You're in the world, but not of the world. It hates me. They're going to hate you for loving me. And then it goes into this 16th chapter. So the context of, of this passage of Scripture carries over into chapter 16. And sandwiched right in the middle of that are these two verses that are repeating something Jesus told them in the 14th chapter about providing a helper. And that helper was going to be with them through this context of, of rejection that they're going to experience. Someone with a wry sense of humor once described a church as a group of porcupines in a snowstorm. We need each other to keep warm, but the closer we get, the more we poke each other. Does that sound about right? I'm glad you're here, Chuck. It just fits, doesn't it? <laughs> no, I'm All right, that's what I thought. That's a good boy. You ran right into that one just like I needed you to. We poke each other, and the more uncomfortable we become. But, of course, it shouldn't be that way. The church should be a place of warmth and fellowship, a place where even the newest member or the latest visitor feels welcome in his home, at home. And this is true of, is this true of your church? Simply attending a worship service doesn't automatically mean closer relationships with others. If you're an old-timer in your church, go out, out of your way to welcome visitors and new members. And if you're a visitor or a new member, make a special effort to get to know the people. Find out what activities the church offers for spiritual growth. What Bible classes are held. Does a group of, of people your age meet regularly? Don't depend on only one worship service a week to help you meet people and grow closer to Christ. If this step sounds 
a little daunting? Remember that your best friend of all, Jesus Christ, will be with you each step of the way. I like that. That came from the, uh, for the Billy Graham devotional book. But uh, what I like about that is that really applied to what the disciples are being told at this time. Their little group was going to have to stick together. Their little group was going to have to depend on each other to encourage and, and, uh, and bolster their spirits and that sort of thing. But they didn't always like each other. And they had differences of opinion. And Jesus had to chastise them a time or two. And they're fixing to grow. So that means they're fixing to have others added in. And how are they going to assimilate them into their, into their group? If you want to make a mess out of things, try to do it with two people. If you really want to mess it up, add a third person. You lose total control. So, the old adage, you know, if you want it done, do it yourself. Well, in a way, that kind of applies, but Jesus, that is not His plan. And that is not His way. So we need each other. So let's look at this passage of Scripture. I put up here a question. Have you ever felt, I'd rather die than live without and then plug in a name or plug in a situation or plug in a job or plug in something? What would cause you, what would cause you to say that? I'd rather die than lose one of my children. I'd rather die than lose a spouse. I'd rather die than lose a good friend. I'd rather die than live somewhere else that may not be as accommodating to what I'm accustomed to. And maybe you've never said that, but I want you to look. I want you to look back in, uh, I'll get it here in a second. Matthew, the 26th chapter. We'll just sing, read the 30th verse. Matthew 26, 30. And after singing a hymn, they went out, on the Mount of, went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, now this, this is Matthew's account of where we are in the book of John. They're traveling to the Mount of Olives. They're traveling to the garden. All right. You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And that troubled them. But after I have been raised, I will go before you in Galilee. But Peter answered and said, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall of you. I would rather die than fall away from you. And that was Peter. Well, we kind of expect that from Peter. He was kind of brash at times and said things and, and seemed to get himself in trouble quite a bit. But I want you to read what's hidden in one of those passages just right down from that. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, this very night before the cock crows, you shall deny me eh, three to five to six to ten times. Who knows? Right, Chuck? Yeah, who knows? Three times, all right? Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Once again, that brash old Peter jumps right out there. Not me, Lord. Not me. But look at the last phrase. All the disciples said the same thing too. So even though we have the recorded words of Peter, what we have is a consensus of attitude. Jesus is talking to them about He is going to depart. He is talking to them about what their job is going to be. What they need to be doing. What they're going to experience in terms of rejection by the people, in terms of rejection by the church. Chapter 16 threatens their very religious foundations. It's going to tell them they can be excommunicated from the synagogue. We've already talked about that as being 
a potential charge that the Pharisees were bringing to people who would not cooperate with them and trying to turn Jesus over. We're going to kick you out of the church if you don't do that. They're going to see that kind of rejection taking place. And the easy thing to do would be jump on the, 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 the Peter boat. I will rather die than be without you. And all of them said that. Now right now, in this group, is the 11. And I think it's important that we think about this for a second. There were more than just these 11. They were not necessarily with them in the upper room. They were not necessarily following them along to, to, uh, uh, to Gethsemane. I'll get this right in a second, I think. <laughs> but there were other believers... And the reason we know that is that in Acts, one of the things they have to do is they have to choose somebody to replace Judas. And the requirements are real simple. You've got to be a believer and you, gotta, you have to witness all of the things Jesus did. You have to be with him from the beginning. Jesus is going to set those, that criteria in this, in this passage. And when he sets that criteria... That means none of us in here could qualify. We've not been with him since the beginning of his ministry. We didn't hear God come down and say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased at the time of his baptism. We didn't see him raise Lazarus. This particular group of people that are traveling with him and hearing this and, and, and listening to what's being said and developing encouragement from what he's saying are going to be the ones tasked with carrying that forward. So we think our job's hard. We think our, our, our situation is tough, that we've got to go outside these walls and talk to somebody about Jesus. And in this country, in this place, in this, in this state, in this county, yeah, somebody might shut a door in our face. Somebody might even laugh at us. But I don't know of too many people that will shoot you. I don't know too many people that will turn you into the authorities and get you arrested and thrown in prison. But that can happen to them. And so, this is a dire situation. Their source of, their source of security, their source of, of, of strength, has resided in Jesus and walking with Jesus. And he's going to leave them. So we come to, we come to this where, where Jesus is going to, to give him a promise, give them a promise, and, and he's going to, in, this, in these two verses, he's going to point out four things that, uh, that they need to be aware of. In the 14th chapter, turn back just a, just a page or two. In the 14th chapter of the 16th verse, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper. Now, I want you to look at the language of that. I will ask the Father. Jesus is going to petition on your behalf and mine, on their behalf. The Father, give them a helper. Jesus is going to do that. Later on, he's going to say, and I will give you a helper. If you ever need proof, proof text, of the validity of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, passages like that help us come. Jesus can ask the Father because Jesus, the incarnate Christ, is God the Father incarnate. And he can ask God the Father and God the Father can provide what Jesus asked. They're two. They're one. And what, what are they giving? A helper. That's them. The power of the Holy Spirit is the same as the creative power of God. The truth of God is the same as the teachings of Christ. There can be no disconnect between the three. 
And so Jesus, Jesus here says, and I will ask the Father, in that 14th verse, and he will give you another helper, and he, that he may be with you forever. And that is the spirit of truth whom the word cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him. But you, Jesus talking to these same 11, but you know him because he abides in you and will be in you. Now, will be in you looks forward to Pentecost. The full display of the power of God is going to be vested in them. So as we, as we look at this passage, it has a lot of things in there that ought to bring us comfort. It has a lot of things in there that ought to, that ought to support our belief in Christ and motivate us to share Christ. He did not want Peter to die with him on the cross. Peter's death on the cross would do nothing in terms of, of promoting and advancing the gospel message. Now later on, Peter will die. We all will die. He needs Peter to stand amongst the world, in the world. And proclaim Christ. So he comes back. And he's going to say. That I'm going to help you. Because it's in the world. The message is about the son. The message is from the father. And it's going to pass on. Through believers. So let's take a look. At what that does. The overall context we've talked about. The verses before and, uh, and, and after imply that the believers and their testimony is going to be to a lost world. A world that rejected Jesus. Literally, at the time he's saying it, they rejected Jesus. Today, you go provide the gospel and there will be those that will reject Jesus. So what was true then is as true today. All right? The presence of the Holy Spirit enables believers to speak boldly and with conviction. Well, what he says is, when the Helper comes, whom I will send from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. Who will bear witness? The Spirit. How can the Spirit bear witness? Because he speaks the truth. He is God's speaking the truth. I suspect most of our problems today, certainly within the church, but within society, is we don't know what to believe. How many times this past week, don't raise your hand, have you said, I don't know what to believe? about masks or government entities or about turmoil or about anything. I don't know what to believe. Someone said this and somebody else said that about the same topic and they're, they're off over here someplace. I don't know what to believe. There is one sure truth. And that truth is the gospel of Jesus. What's the gospel? The good news. What should the focus be of the church? Get to the cross. Preach Christ. Preach the cross. Preach re resurrection. Preach the need for repentance because of sin. All of that's wrapped up in the gospel. How many times, and we've all had opportunities over the, certainly over the course of the last year, to watch various TV preachers and, and that kind of thing and read articles, and we're, we're looking for our, for our spiritual food in a lot of places. And, and we see gospels that are soothing and comforting, and there are times when I need to be comforted. There's times when I need to be soothed, I think. I, I don't, don't mean to say that, but... By the same token, how many times do you see what some of us 
certainly knew. It's a little hellfire and brimstone. Preach Christ crucified. Peter says that. Preach Christ crucified. Because as soon as you preach Christ crucified, then you get the opportunity to talk about he died for my sins and your sins. His death paid a price for me, for you. I know that because it's my sin that he washed away. Preach Christ resurrected, defeated the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death. Genesis. Preach Christ crucified. Preach Christ resurrected. Do you need him? Yes. I have sin. He paid the price for my sin. The result of that is forgiveness. Forgiveness allows hope for eternity. And hope is not, I wish, but I am confident because the God of the cross promised eternity. And if the God of the cross, who can forgive sin, promised eternity, then there is assurance in eternity. If I can't believe the God of the cross can promise eternity, then I really don't think I can quite believe God of the cross can promise forgiveness. Now think about it. Is he powerful enough to forgive sin? Yes. If he's powerful enough to forgive sin, is he powerful enough to promise eternity? Yes. So it, it, it really gets into a, it gets into a point here where he is trying to convince them and assure them. They've got a work to do. And that work is empowering. But they are not going to be expected to rely on their power. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, I think sometimes we sell the Holy Spirit a little short. Maybe just me. I'm sure you all don't. Sometimes we want to think about, well, I can't see the Spirit. I, I probably can get away and hide from the spirit. I, you know, I, I, eh, the spirit's, it's just out there someplace wandering around. The spirit is of God. Who's, who's going to provide it? When the helper comes, whom I will send you, who I, Jesus, will send you from the Father... If God saw the necessity in His holy and righteous plan to send Himself incarnate, He certainly has the power to send a helper. Well, what's the name of that helper? The name of that helper is going to be the Spirit of Truth. Now, lots of times you and I, I think we, we go along, we look at the helper as being... You know, the physician's assistant comes in and gives me a hand when I need it and, and, and reports back to the higher power. But look at what Jesus calls him. The spirit of truth. That characteristic of God that cannot lie. That characteristic of God that always projects truth. What can you do with truth? I said it one time, I said it a dozen times, or maybe a thousand times, I don't know. What's that old uh, movie with, I can't remember, for a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Remember that? Some of you might, may not. What was, who was the guy that was starred in that? You guys remember? Wasn't Tom Hanks. Was, anyway, never mind. Cruz. Tom Cruise was the, was the lawyer, yeah, said that. You can't handle the truth. Well, the idea is that he's going to speak the truth. He's going to guide with the truth. He's going to, he's going to empower us 
with the truth. And it's God's truth. He is the source of that. Tell me something God can't do. Anybody? He cannot lie. He cannot lie. There are some other things we want to chase that rabbit a while, but, but he can't lie. That, you pick good. Chuck, that was the right one. Good. Finally, yeah. He can't lie. So, what we have here, if we have, when the Helper comes, whom I will send you, Jesus talking to his followers, and they've got the attitude that Peter had expressed in Matthew, Lord, I won't let him kill you. I'll die with you. No, you won't, Peter. You'll deny me before the rooster crows in the morning. I'm sure he didn't want to hear that. And everybody else agreed with him. When the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. Now that, that, is a, is a unique statement. I think we've talked enough about all that. The Spirit of truth provided by the Father will bear witness of me. Who are we to glorify as believers? Me? Anybody says yes, you're in trouble. Okay. Who are we to glorify? The question isn't what would Jesus do. The question is who gets the glory. I want a soda pop machine in the church. Who gets the glory? And here, what, what Jesus is telling them, the very one who has creative power to create this earth, the very one that has the power to resurrect and defeat death, the very one that has the power to promise eternal life, will testify of me. So when we go out, when we meet somebody, when we talk to someone about Jesus, oh, I don't like to talk to people. Oh, well, you know, it doesn't bother me, but I know there are others that it does. I, I don't want to talk about Jesus. What if they say, let God talk to them. Let the Spirit of truth talk to them. And I don't mean we ignore them. What's the best witness we've got? What's the best witness you've got? Best witness I've got. Your testimony. What has Jesus done for you? What did that death on the cross, what did that burial and resurrection what do these promises, what did they do for you? That's my testimony. And you cannot, you may not believe it, you may reject it. But you can't deny it. I'm the only one that can die, deny it. You may reject it as truth, but you can't deny what I know is truth. And that was, the, that was the situation that he was putting these disciples in. You're going to be empowered. I'm going to be gone. You're going to be empowered to carry the message. You're just going to be the carriers. The power of the message, the words of the message, the works of the message, the divine word of the message, the truth of the message comes from God. All I can do is tell you how, what it means to me. What, and, and who gets the glory when we do it that way? God gets the glory. I, I'm going to jump over here. This is kind of out of order, but that's all right. I, I quit doing things in order so long ago. A certain young ruler questioned 
Jesus in the uh, 18th chapter of, of Luke in the 18th verse. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, The one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Before we get lost on that, what that is, I want everybody to understand. Jesus asked him to come and follow him. That's the same thing he said to Peter and to John and to Nathaniel. Come, follow me. What did Jesus say to you when you surrendered your life to him? Come, come follow me. An invitation by the very God of messianic God of the Jews said to this rich young ruler, come follow me. But before he said that, he said something else. You lack one thing. You lack one thing. You have a sin of possessions. Go sell everything you've got. Quit depending on yourself and your riches and have faith in me and come follow me. I, it blows my mind. I don't know what I would have done. I don't know. It wasn't there. He, the person was of the right attitude. He had the right mind. He went to the right, uh, right person. He asked the right question. He got a positive invitation. Everything was set. All he had to do. He asked the question, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, you lack one thing. You still have one thing ahead of God in your order of priorities. Go sell all that you got. Come follow me. And that rich young ruler, had he done that, might well have been there with Jesus the, that night walking to Gethsemane. But when he had heard these things, he was very sad, for he was extremely rich. We don't know what happened. It doesn't, it doesn't go on to elaborate about any further discussion that was had. But you know, that's, it happens to me. I assume it happens to you. We let other things get in the way of serving and professing Christ. But that's what Jesus is telling his 11 to do. Rely on the helper. You do the legwork, and the helper will give you the message. He will express the truth. Because his message is the truth. So he goes. And he fumbles things around. And that helper is going to proceed from the Father. The voice and power that gives truth and character are both miracles and gifts. And so what are they going to testify? He's going to, to the lost world, this small group, and there were others out, this small group will testify about Jesus. Now, how is that possible? It's possible because that the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness of me. 26 verse. The Father sends the Helper. The Helper is the Spirit of truth, that character of God that cannot tell a lie. And He will witness of me. 
Well, he's already done that. He's, he's, already, he's already said that. Uh, Jesus had performed miracles. He'd raised Lazarus from the dead. We've already read about that. He's calmed the waters on the sea. He's fed 5,000. We've already studied all of those. He's done visible works that have testified about him. He's taught. They call him, what did the rich run ruler call him? Good teacher. Now, translated, master professor. The one with all of the knowledge. What must I do to be saved? He came to the right to the right person with the right question. And so here they have, here they have this, this thing that's, that's going to be handed to them of what they are to do. They are to witness to a lost world. And that hasn't changed. That's our responsibility too. The day we don't lit, witness to a lost world, the lost world is lost. They're doomed. One generation doesn't witness to the following generation. It's lost. We have a responsibility that God put in place in His plan that requires us to witness, and He's given us the one that will help us do that. So we are inseparably linked to the apostles by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I said a while ago that, that the qualifications were in there. If you go and look in Acts, I think it is... Uh, I'll just look over there. I think it's the second chapter. Maybe it's the first. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, 21. You're right, Kay. She was always the fastest in the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew I'd seen that someplace before. Uh, 121. It is therefore necessary, this is Peter talking, that the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from, from us, one of these should become a witness with us in this resurrection. And they put forward two men, Joseph called Barnab uh, Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Those two men, Jesus did not call as apostles while he was on earth. But they were witnesses to the baptism. They were witnesses in the group that, that went and saw the raising of Lazarus. They were witnesses to the, to the feeding of the 5,000. They had journeyed with them all the way. They met that qualification. And when those died, there are no more. No one else can meet that qualification. But you and I as believers must pick up that challenge to witness must pick up that challenge to go with the power of the Holy Spirit and present the gospel. So we become a part of the, you watch these crime movies, you got to have chain of evidence. You know, if this gun taken from the crime scene passes from this detective's hands into this investigator's hands into this NCIS guy's hands and it goes you know goes around and gets stored someplace there's a there's a chain of evidence who's handled that we've all seen the shows where that gets broken or somebody sneaks it out or something and then okay the whole chain then becomes suspect 
the chain of presentation of the gospel we are integral parts of. And when we break that chain, the gospel is not being presented. They went out. We all know the antics and, and, and stuff of Paul and Peter and John and the places they went and, and, and the ones they discipled and built up and the churches they planted. and the, you know, we, we see that historical aspect of the church. But it did not end in Corinth or Rome or any of those places. It hasn't ended yet, and it's right here at Hillside in McLeod today. But the day we don't take up our responsibility is the day that chain gets broken here. So what he puts in motion here is to carry forward today. Are we important to that motion? Yes, we are. It's vital. And you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. That sets the criteria of what we call an apostle. One set out, called out, set apart with the special qualifications of having been with him from the beginning. And see, the beginning he calls out is not from birth. It's from baptism. What happened at the baptism of Jesus? What significant thing happened with the baptism of Jesus? What did God say? In whom I'm well pleased. That now, how many times did God speak in the New Testament? I'll let you look that one up. Okay. In the Old Testament, God spoke to Moses. God spoke to Abraham. God spoke to, to uh, 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 Noah. The voice of God dealt directly with mankind. In the New Testament, it's rare because he was present in the world. And he spoke through Jesus, but on a few occasions. The voice of God testified of the incarnate God. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. We have a task and a challenge to continue to carry that forward. So we're part of that link. I read from John MacArthur's commentary. He, he said this, God has chosen his people as a means to reach the elect among the lost. I don't know why he made that plan. But there are a whole lot of things I don't know why God did, but he did. As a, me, as a means to reach the elect among the lost. The blessed truth is that whosoever call will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How do we know who the elect of the Lord is if we don't get the message out? And those that receive that message and accept that message will be saved. God knows. But we don't. So our task then is to go. But that can only happen when believers proclaim them, to them the saving truth of the gospel. J. Vernon McGee says, The Holy Spirit bears testimony concerning Christ. If the Lord Jesus Christ is real to you, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. One way to tell whether the Spirit of God is working is whether Christ is being glorified. One way to tell 
if the Holy Spirit is working within us, is Christ being glorified by my life? I don't want to see look raising hands. I don't want to have to. I don't want to have to raise my hand. I don't want to have to display my failures. But I think it bears. It bears on all of us that we can do better, that we can do more, that we can be more faithful in the very task that we have. We have here in this passage, in sandwich between, you're going to be hated and you're going to be ostracized and, and you're going to be despised in the middle of that, but the spirit of truth will be with you. And you'll be given a mission. That mission is to go and to tell. And you tell what the spirit of truth, which abides in you, gives you to tell. And that ought to give us the opportunity then to be able to witness comfortably, expecting, without fear of retribution, the world's going to hate us anyway. Okay? What you don't want is you don't want God to hate you. If the world hates us because we spread the gospel, His name's still glorified because we're doing the work He gave us to do. So, it's just two verses. I've wandered all around it. But uh, I, think, I think you've got the idea. We'll start in chapter 16 next week. And he continues on teaching as he's preparing to uh, the final passages before he, he goes into the garden. Final passages before he prays. And his prayer is, is really, really good. You know, there's, there's, just, there's just so much meat to be gnawed upon and fed with in John's gospel and certainly in these passages because they represent what God wants them to remember. Jesus is the Father that wants to have the legacy of his life, if you would, remembered by his children. And so before he must pass, he tells them, this is what you need to do. This is what you've been prepared for. This is what's going to assist you. Don't be afraid. Encourage one another. That's a, that's a generalized summation of what Jesus is trying to do to these 11 apostles at this time. Okay, we're going to close with a word of prayer.